Hey, welcome to the Bible and Life podcast. Thanks for joining me on this episode. If you're a first time visitor to the podcast, man, thanks for being here. So glad that you're listening to the show today. And if you're a regular listener, man, thanks for being part of the Bible and Life family. If, if you're a listener of the podcast and you're not subscribed to my email list, I would encourage you to swing over to my website and just sign up. I have some free resources that I would love to give you there on the website. Right now, the featured resource is one called Five Priorities of a Disciple-Making Church. And you sign up for the email list, you can get that free resource. But I also have some others about how to study the Bible or how to read the Bible and pray. I got some uh, short little video series on that as well. And so I would encourage you to do that. I, I send out a couple emails a month, one usually giving some sort of resource or tool that I think is particularly helpful to growing spiritually or to understanding the Bible. And another email uh, is usually just sort of stuff I'm working on or stuff I'm working through, stuff I'm learning, kind of a behind the scenes sort of thing. And um, try to just make those super helpful and super valuable to you. In fact, I just had a email subscriber over the weekend um, email me and basically say that she has found one of the resources that I suggested in an email super helpful to her understanding the Bible. And it's really made particularly the gospel bark that she's currently reading super clear. And so she's really found that resource val uh, valuable. And so I just try to do that, send out things that I think will be really helpful to you. And so I would encourage you to swing over to the website and sign up for the email list if you haven't already. All right, we've been working through a series where we're really letting Jesus teach us how to pray. And the what we traditionally call the Lord's Prayer grew out initially, at least in Luke's version, of that question. Lord, teach us to pray. And Jesus gave the Lord's Prayer as sort of a model, a template for how to pray. And so we've been using that template and just listening to Jesus as he teaches us some things about prayer. We've looked at the address, that God has to be addressed, and what's the fundamental or most crucial way to address God. And Jesus gives us the address, Our Father. Not our king, not our master, not our power, but our father. And while king or even master are appropriate titles for God, father is the most central, most core address to God. And so we listen to how Jesus describes God as father, particularly from the prodigal son parable, the prodigal son story. And that helps us have a picture of who we're talking to when we pray, when we talk to God. We um, also looked at Jesus' example of uh, prayer and how he prayed and how he arranged his life for that. And that really set the stage for how we should arrange our life. In this particular episode, I want to look at two of the requests that Jesus gives us right towards the front. But before I uh, look at those, I want to kind of set the stage for helping us maybe appreciate the context, the, the real world context of those requests. So let me just ask some questions. First question is this, have you ever felt like Man, I wish the world was different than it is. You look around at the world and you're like, ah, oh, so much hostility, so much hatred, so much brokenness, so much failure, so much wrongness with the world. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever looked at the world and thought, man, I wish there wasn't starvation. I wish there wasn't uh, killing and murder. I wish there wasn't war. I wish there wasn't hatred. I wish there wasn't... A uh, breakdown in the families and falling out in families so that siblings never talk to each other or moms and dads get divorces and leave kids kind of confused and wondering what's going on. I wish, um, I wish love always prevailed and indifference or hatred didn't. I wish that uh, politicians could work together for the good of their country. I wish that nations didn't fight and blow each other up, right? Have you, have you ever just looked at the world and thought, man, I wish things were different than they are? Well, that, that longing is such a deep, fundamental longing. We have, it seems, built within us this longing for a world that is true and beautiful and good and right. And we live in a world where while there's plenty that's beautiful and good and even true and even plenty of things that are right, there's a whole host of things that are broken and wrong and messed up and confusing, things that just don't seem to be the way it ought to be anymore. And in the, the, the worldview of the Bible, the big story of the Bible, 
all of that is stuff that goes against God and against God's will and against God's ways and against what God ultimately dreamed when he first created the world. And, and the story of the Bible says God is going to make things right again, that he's working to make things right, of, right again. And one of the major biblical themes, biblical pieces of imagery that captures that is God being king. That when God is king, things do work right. Things are good. Things are beautiful. And there isn't all the division and hostility. When God actually rules the world the way it was meant to be ruled, everything is right again. That's one of the major pieces of the biblical story. Now, with that then, we come back to Jesus teaching us how to pray in the Lord's Prayer. And we see uh, the, the, thir- the second and third request in the prayer being this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And Jesus really is um, calling us to be people who pray for God to set things right, for his kingdom to come and his will to be done. And yet, I think sometimes we don't always fully appreciate what, what that means. In fact, I asked on uh, my social media channels the last week, the end of last week, I just asked the question, when you pray your kingdom come, what do you imagine happening? And I think that's a good question for us. You know, we if we have prayed the Lord's Prayer ever at all, well, what do we think we're asking for when we say your kingdom come? And on my Instagram and on my Facebook, uh, the, the responses of people were, were quite varied on that, and they were very insightful and very very honest, and I think very, very good, helpful responses People, some people said, I have really no idea. Uh, other people say, man, I'm going to have to think about that a little bit more. <laughs> One gal, Lori, said, I- I'm going to drink my coffee and um, chew on that a little bit more, right? I need more coffee. Um, and then we actually had a pretty good little interchange about it, and Lori had some pretty good insights as to what that meant. Uh, I, there was people that um, waxed theological about uh, Jesus reigning and ruling and, and what that means, and people who waxed poetical about some of the imagery from the Old Testament about the lion and the lamb lying down together like friends and not being uh, worried about what's going to happen because there's peace and harmony in nature and in the world. Um, and people waxed philosophical about justice and rightness. And so this wide range of responses to what do you think you're asking God to do when you ask for his kingdom to come? And so in this episode, I just want to explore that. What, what are we asking? What, what does that mean? What is Jesus expecting us to be thinking and, and praying when we're saying your kingdom come? What are the implications for us? And in order to really understand that prayer request, your kingdom come, your will be done, we need to understand Jesus' teaching on the kingdom of God a little bit and what that means. Because I think um, so much church history has happened and so much church teaching has happened that sometimes we're confused and we don't always hear it the way Jesus intended it or what Jesus meant. And so, as I said, in the big story of scripture, um, that, that that's one of the major themes that God is king and yet he's he, he's coming as king, and we're looking for his kingdom to come. And we know God reigns, but we want his rule to come, and that there's a day coming when that's going to happen. And it's in that spirit that Jesus teaches us to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. And, and so when we look at the ministry of Jesus here with this request in Matthew chapter 6, your kingdom come, Well, Jesus is teaching us to pray about something that hasn't yet happened, right? Like, we're expecting the kingdom to come at some point in the future. Um, And so there's a future element to the kingdom. It's going to come someday. And yet, at the same time, Jesus in his teaching also says things like this. Here's Mark chapter 1, verse 15. Jesus says, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is here or at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. And so Jesus in his teaching is basically saying, well, he's bringing the kingdom in him, through him, through his preaching and his teaching and his ministry. He's really ushering in God's kingdom. In fact, in Luke chapter 11, verse 20, Jesus uh, really responding to a criticism from some of his opponents Uh, about his miracles and they accused him of casting out demons by the power of satan himself and jesus really challenges on that and then he says this luke 11 20 says 
But if I cast out demons by the finger of God, then God's kingdom has come upon you. And so there's a sense in which Jesus is inaugurating, bringing in God's kingdom. So the kingdom has come in the person of Jesus. It's already here. And yet we're supposed to pray for it to come. And that tension, I think, is really important for us to understand in the ministry of Jesus, that there's this tension in the teaching of Jesus between the kingdom is here, but the kingdom is not yet here. It's come, but it's not yet come completely and fully, so we're praying for it to come. Uh, scholars, theologians refer to that as the already and the not yet, um, that Jesus has already inaugurated God's kingdom and thus it's already active and present and at work in this world, and yet it's not yet here fully and completely. And we live in, in that tension in the New Testament between those two realities, between what has already happened and what has not yet happened. And so the kingdom is here uh, partially. It's been inaugurated. It's broken into the here now. It's available to us. We can live according to its resources and according to its wisdom and according to its power in and through Jesus and the Spirit. And yet we're looking for it forward to it coming completely and fully someday. That's the nature of the kingdom. All right. Now, with that set up, let's at least define what Jesus means by that. What is the kingdom? Well, the kingdom of God, when he says the kingdom of God has come upon you, or the kingdom of God is at hand, he's really referring to God's reign as king, God's rule or reign over all things as king, that God is king. And so the kingdom of God um, essentially refers to the kingship of God, that God is becoming king. Now, isn't God always king? Well, yes. Uh, God has been king from the beginning, right? God is king over all things. God is sovereign. He's in charge. He is uh, the world's true king. He is Lord of all things. That is true. And at the same time, however, we know this world is a place of revolt and rebellion against his kingship. And so the, the story of the Bible is the story of God bringing his kingdom into this world the way it always was supposed to be. And um, thus God becoming king fully and completely over all things again. Not because God isn't king, but because his kingship isn't always recognized and, and thus isn't always submitted to and carried out. And so when Jesus says the kingdom of God is here, it's present in and through him, he's saying, I'm inaugurating this long-awaited culmination of everything God has been doing to to bring his kingdom, bring his kingship, his rule to this world. That's what he's saying. And so when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done, we're, we're really praying for God to effectively come as king and bring his kingship to this world. And so this, this request, your kingdom come, your will be done, this request involves several assumptions. Let me just list off several assumptions kind of that underlie this request. One is that God is active and involved in the history of this world and in the world today, that God is here, he's active, that he can work, that he didn't just create the world and then move off you know, to a distant corner of the universe and he's really uninvolved, it's like, ah, oh, you go your own way. No, we're praying, we're asking for God to bring his rule, his reign, his kingship, which assumes that he's active in the world. He's active throughout history. This uh, request also assumes that God's rule and God's will um, is at best only partially um, fulfilled now, that it's only partially here now, that God is king, but not completely and not totally. Um, and so it's only partially carried out in this world. This request also assumes that history is working towards a goal, that history isn't cyclical, that it's just going to keep going on and on and on, or that history isn't just slowly going to peter out as the earth gets colder or that the sun gets colder and colder and, you know, the earth just kind of eventually dies off, right? Like, no, that history is going somewhere and God's in charge of that history. It's moving towards a goal and it culminates with God becoming king over all things. And this request also assumes that God's kingship and God's will is good, that it's the best thing that could happen to this world, and that's why we want it, and that's why we long for it, and that's why we pray for it to come. And so when we, when we pray for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done, what we're really praying, if we understand the full biblical worldview, we're praying for 
things to be made right for all those things that are wrong in our world that we can recognize, that we feel in our bones, for all the division and brokenness and hostility and all the marginalization and oppression and all the hatred and the starvation and everything that's wrong with this world that just gnaws at our soul when we see it on the news or at times in our more reflective moments when we're just like, man, I wish things were different, right? When we're praying for God's kingdom to come, we believe that God's kingdom sets everything right and that all will be well someday. And that's what we're longing for. That's what really all humans are longing for. And we believe the solution to all those problems isn't you know, a different government in your whatever country you live in. It's not better politicians or you know, voting in the right candidate, as important as maybe those might be. We believe that ultimately the solution is for God's kingdom to come and his will to be done. And so we pray and we uh, long and we look forward to and we wait for God to become king over all things. That's the heart of this prayer. And so there's a really a global aspect to that and a personal aspect to this prayer. The global aspect is we see injustice in this world. We see abuse of power in this world. We see hunger and starvation and exploitation and oppression. We see alienation and marginalization and wrongness in this world, and we long for it to be made right. And what's the first thing we should do when we see that? The first thing we should do isn't you know, post a rant on social media or uh, criticize our politicians, the first thing we should do is we should pray, Oh, Father, may your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the first thing we should do when we see the brokenness and the wrongness in this world, that we recognize that God is the ultimate solution to it. His kingship is the solution to it. We want his will to be done, which means... We want what God wants to be done in this world because it's already being done perfectly and completely in God's realm in heaven, and we want it to be done in this world right where we live. And so we pray, Father, may your will be done. Father, would you come as king and would you set things right? And we long for that and we look forward to that and we want that and we yearn for that. So that's sort of the global aspect to this prayer is we know the world's not right. We know our country's not right, right? We know international politics isn't right. We know things are broken in local politics and in our neighborhood. We see that, we experience that, and we want things to be right. And so we pray, Father, would your kingdom come and would your will be done? That's really the first response. Now, there's other things we, we can and we should do, but our first response should be that. So there's a global aspect. There's also a personal aspect to this prayer, this prayer request um, is really easy. Oh, your kingdom come, your will be done. It's really easy as long as God's kingdom and God's will kind of lines up with ours, right? Like when, when our will and God's will, when they match, that's easy. It's easy to pray that. Uh, it's hard to pray that um, when God's will and our will don't match up, when they're at odds with each other, when what God says we should do and what we feel like doing, we want to do, or when we think would be best, and then God's will is different than that, that's when this prayer uh, becomes a little more challenging. And at that moment, whose will wins out? Whose will wins? And one of the implications of this prayer is that for followers of Jesus, God's will needs to win out. That in our little kingdom, in our little sphere of influence, where we reign as king or we reign as queen, in our little sphere of influence, we're asking for God's kingdom to come. We're asking for God's will to be done in our sphere of influence, just like it is in heaven, in our neck of the woods, in our neighborhood, in the places we can control, and in the way we act, and in our relationships. Where, right? Like, we're, we're asking for for God's kingdom to win out in our own personal life. Um, we see this modeled for us by Jesus himself on uh, the night before he's crucified, in the garden, in agony, because he knows what's about to happen, and he knows the turmoil and the torment physically and spiritually that's coming uh, his way. And there he is in agony in the garden. What does he pray? Father, if possible, let this cup meaning the cup of his suffering, the cup of his crucifixion, the cup of his torment. Let this cup pass from me, but not what I want, what you want. 
That is Jesus modeling for us at a personal level this prayer. May your kingdom come, your will be done in my life as it is in heaven. And this is the attitude and this is the posture of soul really implicit in this prayer, this submission of our life to God, this submission of our will to God's will, this laying down our kingship so that God would be king of our life, really the, the, uh, the implicit posture of soul embodied in this request is surrender. God, your will be done. God, may your kingship happen in my life. And when we pray that, we need to be thinking of the places that we actually live uh, on a daily basis, in our home, in our neighborhood, and in our schools, and in our relationships with our family and friends, and uh, in our workplaces, and the way we carry out our work, and the way we relate to our co-workers, in our churches, and in our small groups, right? Um, in um, uh, at the store, in our places of business, God, may your kingdom come and your will be done. And insofar as we have control of our decisions and our choices, we surrender, we submit. And so that's really the attitude embodied in this prayer is surrender or submission to the kingship and the will of God. And we want God's kingdom to come in our little uh, our little sphere of influence, our little kingdom. God, would you be king? Would you reign just as you do in heaven? Would you do so here? And then by the, the wisdom of Jesus and the power of his spirit, we begin to act increasingly in sync with God's kingdom and God's kingship. That's, that's the goal of this prayer. That's the attitude as we learn to pray and we let Jesus teach us to pray. That's, that's the attitude that most fundamentally needs to really govern our life of prayer that our life of prayer is governed by an attitude of surrender and submission, just like Jesus. Not my will, but yours be done. Not my kingdom, but your kingdom come. And so we pray for that to happen in our life and then in the world around us and beyond. All right, thanks for tuning in to the Bible and Life podcast. And as always, just know this is a listener-supported show, and so those of you who are patrons of the podcast or uh, donate through World Family Mission, man, God bless you. Thank you for your support. Thanks for making this possible. May you continue to pray for this to be used by God to the very end that we talked about in this episode, that God could use even this simple little podcast to help his kingdom to come and his will to be done just a little bit more here on earth as it is in heaven. Hey, thanks for being a part of the Bible and Life family. God bless you guys, and I look forward to talking with you again next week.